A gigantic monster stomps across the land, with nothing able to stop its rampage except for, come and eat, cries out a voice, and the monster suddenly stops and falls to the side. The child picks up his toy and runs back to where his mother and father have spread out a picnic lunch. As they eat, the boy asks his father about the nearby buildings, a series of six identical structures, each of which is a small rectangular building with a satellite dish on top of it. The weathered buildings look like they have been out here for some time, and the father tells the boy that he isn't sure exactly what they are or what their purpose is, but that they were probably built during the war. What war? The young boy asks. The Pacific War, his father answers. What was that? It was a war fought by many countries of the world. Why did they fight? The boy asks. Well, there were a lot of reasons. What were some of the reasons? The father has played this game many times before, and he knows if he doesn't end this line of questioning now, that he'll never be able to eat his lunch. The mother, sensing the same, tells the boy that if he wants to, he can go and play with his toy some more. The boy doesn't need to be given the option again. He quickly gets up and grabs his toy monster before running off to play. Don't go too far, his mother calls out as she watches her son head in the direction of one of the buildings. The boy stops in the shadow of one of the large satellite dishes and sits down in the grass to resume his monster's path of destruction across the countryside. As the monster moves through the tall grass, though, the shadow he is sitting in suddenly starts to shift. The boy looks up to see that the satellite dish on top of the building is moving. With a groan, it begins to turn and change its angle. And it isn't just the one on the building closest to him that's moving. He can see that each of the six satellite dishes are doing the same thing. They're all turning to point towards the same spot on the horizon. The boy squints in the sunlight and sees what they're all now directed towards. Off, far in the distance, is a real monster. It's a massive looking creature, a huge half fish, half lizard, covered in scales and spiky fins. It must be at least 50 meters tall or more, and it's coming straight towards him. The boy can already hear the sounds of its giant webbed feet stomping and shaking the ground. And as it gets closer, its high-pitched shrieks and cries become audible too. Adding to the cacophony, an air raid siren begins to wail, followed by the sounds of gunfire, the marching of hundreds of boots, and the roar of engines. The boy looks around, but he doesn't see any of it. It's just him, the buildings, and the monster. The boy can't run, though. He's frozen in fear. All he can do is watch as it swipes at trees and power lines, knocking them down with ease, all while getting closer and closer. The satellite dishes finally finish their slow alignment, and there's a loud humming noise, followed by a loud cracking sound, as each one emits a bright beam of electricity at the monster. The creature stops its assault and howls in pain as the six satellites focus their beams on it. The beams disappear, and the monster appears stunned, but then it looks up and continues to come forward, this time even faster than before. The monster is only hundreds of feet away now, and the boy doesn't know what to do. He's too scared to even scream for help. He closes his eyes and starts to cry when he's abruptly lifted into the air. The boy opens his eyes to see that it's his father. He picks up the boy and starts to run as fast as he can. The boy can see over his father's shoulder that the monster has not changed its course to follow them. It seems to still be focused on the building he was playing next to. The monster finally reaches the building and begins swiping at it, tearing it apart as the other satellites slowly realign, all pointing at the creature once again. The sound of the invisible army increases, and the monster reels as if it is struck by unseen weapons. It suddenly rears back in pain as an artillery shell appears just feet away from it before exploding in the creature's face. But nothing seems able to deter it, and it keeps clawing at the building with the satellite dish. The father finally reaches the mother, who grabs the boy and embraces him tightly. There is a loud noise, and the family turns to watch as the monster finishes destroying the building and turns its attention to one of the others. But then the dishes unleash another blast of electricity at it with a thunderous crack. The creature howls in pain as it stumbles and falls to its knees. It is struggling to get back up when yet another blast hits it and it falls to the ground. It breathes a couple of final, labored breaths before it closes its eyes, its enormous tongue lolling out of its mouth. The creature is finally dead. A loud celebratory cheer goes up in the empty field from what sounds like hundreds of people as the creature begins to slowly fade from view before eventually disappearing completely. Meanwhile, all the family can do is stare in amazement at the bizarre scene they have just witnessed. The extremely strange events that just befell this average family may sound like the plot of a movie, and in some ways, it was, because this is SCP-2954, also known as Looping Kaiju Killing. SCP-2954 is an anomaly that consists of several distinct components. 
The first, SCP-2954-1A, are the six large structures that resemble buildings with satellite dishes, which are located near a now-deserted rural town in Japan. The word resemble is very important, because these are not actual satellite dishes, but instead appear to be nothing more than facsimiles of real ones. The interior of the SCP-2954-1A buildings lack all of the mechanical components one would expect to find inside, and instead contain only a crude rope and pulley system which control the satellite dishes on the building's roof. Despite their lack of internal machinery, the satellite dishes are nonetheless somehow capable of discharging powerful electric arcs of energy, which they only do when confronted by an SCP-2954-2 instance. SCP-2954-2 refers to creatures which have a mix of reptilian, amphibious, and fish-like traits. They are always 50 to 60 meters in height, and most of their body is smooth and blue-gray in color, except for their scaled underbellies, which are red. Both their back and forearms have large spiny fins, and SCP-2954-2 instances walk upright on two legs, though they are always hunchback. Their mouths are also always agape and are capable of spitting a highly corrosive acid. These creatures appear during a period of time that have been designated as Subaraya events. These events, which start every seven days, consist of a single instance of SCP-2954-2 manifesting near the SCP-2954-1A buildings before it begins destroying its surroundings. The buildings will then activate, turning their attention on the creature and firing their electric arcs at it in an attempt to stop its rampage. This will cause SCP-2954-2 to focus its attention on one of the buildings, which it will then try to destroy. As it does so, the sounds of weapons being fired, vehicles moving, and orders being shouted in Japanese can be heard. This phantom army, which has been designated as SCP-2954-1B, is only heard, not seen, and there are never any physical signs of their fight, save for the creature's own reactions to the weapons and the occasional artillery shell that will materialize in midair before striking it. During these Tsuburaya events, the SCP-2954-2 instance will always destroy at least one of the satellite dish buildings, and various other explosions roughly equivalent to what would be expected from small vehicles being destroyed will also be seen as it fights back against the 2954-1B army. Eventually, the combined assault of the 1A and 1B forces will be enough to overwhelm the creature, and it will collapse, grow transparent, and eventually disappear completely. A disembodied cheer will be heard, presumably from the 1B army, and any damage to the environment, including the 1A buildings, will be reversed. But what is the cause of this endless cycle of destruction and restoration? Where do the creatures come from, and what do they want? And who is the invisible army that always stands ready to fight back against the rampaging monsters? The answers to those questions may have been discovered while exploring the area where the Tsuburaya events take place. There, in another small abandoned building, SCP Foundation agents discovered a trove of objects that may shed some light on just what these creatures are. The objects located included various movie posters, film reels, and documents that appear to be related to the production and distribution of motion pictures. The posters seem to depict creatures quite similar to the SCP-2954-2 instances, and the title of the poster when translated from Japanese reads, Fukairu's Assault. When agents viewed the footage on the film reels, they found that it depicted a scenario quite similar to the Tsuburaya events. Also of interest are a series of notes found within a filing cabinet inside of the building, with several being of particular note. The first, when translated from Japanese, reads, Our sponsor gave 20 monsters to shoot. We'll pick the best footage. The second, which is dated to 1974, says, Filming completed. Don't forget, call our sponsor to say further shipments are unneeded. The third and fourth are both addressed to what may be the film's producers, and they read, Do you need more Fukairu? We can resupply until you're satisfied and, you have not replied for a while, regardless, we will send another shipment, happy filming. But perhaps strangest of all is that there are multiple similar versions of the last note, and while the oldest is dated to 1972, additional instances continue to appear to this day, with new letters sporadically manifesting inside of the filing cabinet. The obvious danger that is caused by a rampaging 50 meter tall monster is clear, and this anomaly has been classified Euclid as a result. Though since the creature is inevitably always killed by the SCP-2954-1 forces, containment is instead focused on keeping the public away from the area. Guards have been stationed around the area to prevent civilians from entering during Tsuburaya events, and any members of the public who do manage to witness an event are to be administered Class A amnestics. What is the origin of these looping kaiju? Did someone attempt to harness an anomalous source in order to produce special effects for their film? 
If so, were they killed by their own creation before being able to turn it off, leading to a never-ending cycle of attacks? While we may never know the answer for sure, at least the result is entertaining. Provided you keep your distance, that is. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-2863, the Gashodokuro, for another giant frightening SCP that hails from Japan. Cut! And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.